Um, welcome everybody to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And uh, tonight we are continuing our deep dive study into the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. Uh, this is a sutra that is part of the Ratnakuta collection, the Heap of Jewels collection. Um, this is a collection of some 49 different sutras, and we've been spending weeks, months studying just one of the sutras in here. Um, this, this sutra is very good. It is a very good introduction to the entirety of the Bodhisattva path. Indeed, that's where we started. Bodhisattva Akshayamati, inexhaustible mind or inexhaustible intellect, ask the Buddha about Buddhahood. And this is what happens when you ask the Buddha about Buddhahood. It, it's, it's weeks and months later. <laughs> um, but the structure of the sutra, just to remind you, was that the basis of the Bodhisattva path are the 10 paramitas. And we went through each of the paramitas, a night on each paramita, more or less. And then the Buddha actually had even 10 observances or practices that we could do for each of the paramitas. Then, after laying out the paramitas, the observations or practices of each of the paramitas, the Buddha then began to describe to Bodhisattva Akshayamati these. Oh, one moment. There we go. Sorry about that. Thanks, that sounds better. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, I realized that. Okay, so now, <laughs> after the, <laughs> the Buddha described the 10 paramitas and the 10 practices, the Buddha began to describe these visions that a bodhisattva would have as they began their coursing through the 10 stages of bodhisattva-ness or bodhisattvahood. And, you know, today or tonight, this evening, this is going to be an important uh, moment for me to remind everybody what it means to be a bodhisattva is it is the path towards Buddhahood, towards becoming a Buddha. And so what that means is, is that the life story of Siddhartha. You remember Siddhartha, right? Born with everything that they wanted, with he want that he wanted. And eventually, after being exposed to the realities of old age, sickness, and death, Siddhartha renounced, spent years practicing meditation, yoga, various austerities, and then eventually became enlightened and then came back into the world, out of the forest, out of the meditative states, and taught the Dharma, taught us all about what, what was realized. The reason why I remind us of that general arc of the life of the Buddha is because what it means to be a bodhisattva is not that one is looking back 2000, 2500 years, looking back to the life of the Buddha and, and, and being in awe or reverence of it, one actually looks to the events of the life of Siddhartha because they are these archetypal moments in the journey of the Bodhisattva. So Siddhartha now becomes this archetypal hero's journey that we all go through eventually and what the Buddha is describing are the 10 stages of development that, that he went through as well to reach the state of ultimate enlightenment. And what he's telling Bodhisattva Akshayamati is that as you go through this process, you're going to have these visions. And tonight we're on our ninth vision of the Bodhisattva. And this is the vision that a bodhisattva will have just before they are about to abide in the ninth 
stage, the ninth Bhumi level. This is a stage called the Sadhumati, um, the subtle mind, right? So this is actually Bodhisattva Akshayamati. Akshayamati means inexhaustible mind. Well, this is Sadhumati, subtle mind. If you do have your standard English translation of the sutra, they call this uh, meritorious mind. Um, you, uh, yeah, yeah, that's legitimate translation of the Chinese, the legitimate, legitimate translation of the Sanskrit, but sad or sadhu can definitely also mean it's more about kind of like subtle, almost a bit mysterious in a way. And so that's this stage, the ma the mis the subtle mind. And I'm going to say more about that stage and what that stage means a little bit later. But we're about to get into the vision that a bodhisattva will have right before they abide in that stage. And there's a lot, this is one of those nights where I definitely have too much to say. I have way too, too, too much on my mind, on uh, you know, ideas around this. And so we're going to dive right into the vision. We're going to dive right into sort of dissecting the vision because that's sort of um, kind of the main point of tonight is to get into that. Um, I'm I'm hesitant to even re read the standard translation because there's just so many things that I I, I change or I would like to change. Oh, I mean, I'll do I'll read it just because the grammar is better just because the grammar is a little better. So when a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage of the meritorious wisdom or subtle mind or meritorious mind, subtle wisdom, the ninth stage, they will first have a vision of themselves as a wheel-turning sage king, a universal monarch, teaching the true dharma, surrounded by innumerable hundreds of thousands of millions of myriads of kings or monarchs or regents, and shaded by various pure jeweled canopies. That's the vision. I, I, I've tried my best here. Again, you know, as these goes along, I couldn't for the life of me draw a million billion nayutas of these things. So, you know, I'm not even gonna try, but we do have our sort of these monarchs, these regions. I have a little bit to say about the grammar actually of it that it's not exactly clear it's not exactly clear what's going on here, but just to start us off, there's one theme. It's the theme for tonight. If, if last Sunday's theme was the lion, the lion in Buddhism, the lion's roar, the lion's throne, and these uh, the, the lion king, if last week was the lion, this week is this idea of the wheel turning sage king, otherwise known as the Chakra Vartin Raja, the wheel turning sage king. So there's a few other things going on here with these uh, jeweled canopies and all of that. But first and foremost, the Bodhisattva is going to have a vision of themselves as a Chakravartin Raja, a wheel-turning sage king. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what that means in, in a variety of ways. Pre-Buddhist, Buddhist, and even beyond Buddhist. I want to kind of touch upon what this idea is. So... I think the, 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 the coolest place to start is what I've been referencing, which is the life story of Siddhartha, the archetypal journey of the Bodhisattva as 
depicted in the life story of Siddhartha, otherwise known as Shakyamuni Gautama the Buddha. So if you know the story, great. If you don't, when the Buddha is first born, there is a wise rishi, a rishi, a seer, a sita, I think his name was, a wise rishi seer who saw the signs. Maybe they were astrological signs or maybe they were uh, uh, me, you know, uh, weather events and things like about that. But this rishi seer seeing the signs came to Magadha came to the kingdom of Sudhana, the, the father of Siddhartha, because he had heard that there was this being born into the world. And the, the, the story of the Buddha is that when he was first born, he had two auspicious lakshana, two auspicious characteristics or marks on his body. One of those Lakshana, one of those auspicious marks or signs were these thousand spoked wheels on the Buddha or Siddhartha's, the palms of his hands and the palms of his feet, the bottoms of his feet. These thousand spoked wheel emblems. Siddhartha, the, the baby, <laughs> also had a white tuft of hair in between his eyebrows. And what the Rishi Seer Asita said was that based on these two Lakshana, based on these two marks, this child has two destinies in front of it. Based on the thousand spoked wheels on the palms of the hands and the feet, he may become a Chakravartin Raja, a wheel turning sage king. Or, Asita said, because of the white tuft of hair, which is a sign of wisdom and enlightenment, he may go on to become a great spiritual religious teacher. So the, the, the story, of course, is that the king very much wanted his child to become a wheel turning sage king. And that's why Sudhana, the, 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 the Buddha Siddhartha's father, shielded him from the harsh realities of the world because he wanted him to, to adore the princely life and go on to become that king, to become a Chakravartanaja. Now, the reason why the Buddha's father wanted him to become a Chakravartanaja is because it, it seems that before the Buddha, before Buddhism, there was this idea of a wheel turning sage king, or I should say actually just a wheel turning king. I'm, I'm actually adding that word sage because that happens in Buddhism, but I want you to know that there is this pre-Buddhist idea of a Chakravartin Raja, a wheel turning king, and without getting into the very, very, very long, very ancient history of India and the Indus Valley, and even more than that, it does seem that there is this much, much older tradition. This is gonna be come out in these ancient Sanskrit epic poems like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, right? But what a wheel turning king was seemingly was kind of like he had chariots, <laughs> he had the wheel. And there were some other people that were still not without, not with the wheel, <laughs> you know, running around maybe on horseback, but there was some people who had the wheel. And so a wheel turning king, it's such an old idea that the anthropologist in me feels like it goes back to a, a class of people or a whole race of people who had invented in a way the wheel, the chariot and all kinds of other things. Um, there's a lot more that I could say about this uh, ancient history 
it borders on deep mythology where some people think uh, Chakravartin Rajas had UFOs. Just letting you know, because I know you're out there that you've heard this history. And I want you to know, yes, there's a early, or I mean, there is a 20th, 21st century reading of the Chakravartin that they he had some sort of uh, machine that he could fly and it sounds like a UFO. Um, maybe, or maybe if you've never seen a chariot before, it is like a land speeder. It is like, I don't know, but it, it doesn't actually matter because my point is, is that there was a pre-existing idea in India of a great, great conquering king that they called a wheel turning king. And the Buddha's father wanted him to be that kind of king and definitely didn't want him going, running around in the forest with his white tuft of hair, trying to get enlightened or something like that, right? Now, within the Buddhist tradition, so I'm shifting gears now, in the Buddhist tradition, there is the idea of the wheel turning sage king. And now the wheel has shifted because now we are talking about the Dharma wheel, the Dharma chakra pavartin, the turner of the Dharma wheel. And of course, the very, 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 very first sutra, the first teaching of the Buddha is called the Dharma chakra pavartin sutra turning the dharma wheel and that is indeed what the buddha is said to have done actually i'm i'm right here to, i'm teaching the dharma so it's undeniable he turned the dharma wheel so the buddha is said to have turned the dharma wheel for us in this world got this thing going and so within the world of buddhism there is this idea of the wheel turning sage king and basically what that is, is, you know, the premier example of the Dharma, the Dharma Chakra Parvartin Raja. The premier example of that is King Ashoka or Emperor Ashoka or Ashoka the Great, who is considered sort of this, well, he was a kind of a bloody conqueror, but once he conquered everybody and everything, he turned to Buddhism and became a Buddhist, they say. And Regardless of his uh, uh, past, the idea is, is that as emperor of the subcontinent, Ashoka, Ashoka the Great, Emperor Ashoka is celebrated, is celebrated in the world of Buddhism because as emperor, he turned, he continued to turn the Dharma wheel by supporting the Sangha, by supporting the, the Dharma and the Buddha in that way. And so what happens in Buddhism is, well, I guess I kind of glossed something. So here, two things happen. One, those auspicious marks on the Buddha's body, the thousand spoked wheels and the tuft of hair, it's not that he had these two different paths. He actually fulfilled both paths is what they will say. And so what starts to happen within the Buddhist world is this beautiful, I mean, it's, it's a really beautiful twist of a metaphor, but it is the, you know, the, the Buddha as conqueror of Mara of evil, uh, I, I mean, in greed, anger, delusion. So they start to use the, or at times Buddhism uses the language of, of course, the monarchy, the ruler, the conqueror, but not with a sword and not with a chariot, but with the truth, with compassion, with wisdom in these things. And so it's an interesting kind of twist of fate, if I could use the expression, that the Buddha fulfilled that dual destiny of being a great ruler and a wise sagely enlightener. So the Buddha in a way, or Siddhartha, I should qualify, is the first of these um, 
Dharma chakra pravartan rajas, right? These Dharma wheel turning kings. And then, like I said, Ashoka becomes another one because he supported the Bo supported Buddhism. So um, Kanishka the first, Kanishka the Great in the Kushan Valley is also considered a Dharma Chakra Pavartan Raja, a wheel turning sage king, because Kanishka also greatly supported Buddhism. And if I, I I want to transition just quickly to my third description of the wheel turning sage king. So my first description was the pre-Buddhist one. My second description is the main line Buddhist one, Ashoka, the Buddha. But then there's this other idea of what does this mean? What, you know, and, and I'm trying to give us a lot of, to, to go on tonight. For what does it mean for the Bodhisattva to have a vision of themselves as a Dharma Chakra Pavartan Raja, a wheel turning sage king? And the third way of thinking about this is sort of, I mean, you kind of have to think about the, the normal the normal ruler, <laughs> right? And what I mean by that is, is like, you know, I don't know how many rulers or whatever you had in your life, but when I think of the people who have posed as rulers of my world in my life, they have definitely not seemed to exude compassion or wisdom or enlightenment, quite the opposite, actually. There seems to be this kind of, um, you know, I don't know what. <laughs> there seems to be this contest for egocentrism. And if you win that, you kind of get elected leader and it keeps going or something. My point is, and this is not anything new, new to the world that leaders are not tend to tend, don't tend to be the most compassionate, wise people, right? And so what I mean is, is that the the vision or the dream of Buddhism is that there would be someone in a rulership position that would actually be compassionate and wise and actually use that position of power for good rather than evil in that sense. That's the idea of a, of a Chakravartin Raja, a wheel turning king, that, or at least this is my third interpretation of it. And it's a very Buddhist interpretation of it, which is this vision or a dream of an enlightened, an enlightened leader in, the, in that way, you know? Um, I, by the way, I, I have to say it right now because I'll probably forget. Jack, Jack Kerouac, right? Dharma bum extraordinaire, right? He's famous for having said, that there will, what did he say? It was something along the lines of, and I'm misquoting Kerouac, but I'm trying to get his, his point right. He basically said something like, there, there won't be peace, either world peace or peace in this country or whatever, until there's a meditation room in the White House. <laughs> right? And, and, that speaks of the, the wheel turning sage king, that they, they would need a meditation room in the White House if they were going to be like the, the wheel turning sage king president of the United States. They would need a meditation room. So keep all of that in mind. Keep those ideas in mind that it, there's a pre-Buddhist idea of like a supreme ruler conqueror there is a Buddhist idea of the wise, sagely ruler. And then there is this dream or this vision for the way the world could be a very different place if we had such wise, compassionate rulers. All right. Those are some opening remarks on this vision. Any questions or anything before I dive deeper into the other symbolism and the other meaning of the wheel turning king, by the way? Much more to say about that. Very good. Sweet. Okay. So right away, there's a few different elements. There's not just this. 
Um, I, I mentioned um, the, the vision, or no, sorry, the uh, prophecy, I think it's called, the prophecy of the young Siddhartha, and that that prophecy that he would either become a wheel-turning sage king or a enlightened teacher, that prediction, that prophecy, it was made based on these thousand spoked wheels that were on the palms of the hands and feet. And I mentioned that those are called lakshana, that those are these characteristics or qualities of, um, well, they're characteristics that are displayed by the Chakravartin, by the wheel turning sage king, they're characteristics and qualities displayed by enlightened teachers in terms of the white tuft of hair. And the reason why I'm drawing your attention to that, that is that what the sutra says is that the bodhisattva will have a, a lakshana, a, a vision of themselves with the lakshana, with the characteristics of a wheel turning sage king. Does that mean Bodhisattva Akshayamati is going to look down one day and see thousand spoked uh, wheels on the palms of his hands and feet? I don't know. That's oh, now that is now open for possibility that that is what this vision means, because that is indeed what it means to have the marks of a wheel turning sage king. There are other marks as well. But I wanted to point that out, that there's kind of a deep thing going on here with the conversation about lakshana, conversation about characteristics. Then the next part is that this bodhisattva will have a vision of themselves with the marks of a Chakravartin Raja with a, of a wheel turning sage king, and they will be teaching the Samyak Dharma, the true or correct proper Dharma. So I, I've tried my best, you know, these are stick figures, I'm not an artist. But to the best of my ability, what I wanted to capture here with my Bodhisattva Akshayamati's vision of himself, I wanted to capture this mudra of the Dharma Chakra Mudra, which is this mudra and this mudra together. And I've been looking around for this one about exactly how these are poised but it's definitely about making the two circles, having the right one facing out. This is called the, the uh, gesture of reasoning, the Vitaraka ma, uh, Mudra, I think. And so it's an adaptation of this with another one. And so you'll see images of the Buddha doing this gesture. And that's, if I could draw, that's what I would love to have my Bodhisattva Akshayamati doing. And that is the gesture of teaching the true correct Dharma. That is called the, the Dharma Chakra Mudra, the Dharma Wheel Mudra. And you should know that if you ever see a Buddha doing that gesture, nine times out of 10, it means it's a gesture of the Buddha teaching the Dharma, that that's the that's what that gesture means. And well, the one, one thing that I want to point out, I've tried to capture it here. So this is our Bodhisattva Akshayamati, and he is now teaching the Dharma. We've come a long way. <laughs> is my point. From the early days of Akshayamati, Bodhisattva, inquiring to the Buddha about the, these practices, this is the point where the Bodhisattva has a vision of themselves teaching the Dharma, and not just teaching the Dharma, of course, teaching the Samyak Dharma, the true, proper, or correct Dharma. And they are going to be surrounded by all of these other kings. All right. So 
one of the things that I, I said last week, and I alluded to what was ha going to happen this week, I never would have even caught this had I not slowed this down <laughs> to a vision a week. But it's a very interesting thing that a few weeks ago, the Bodhisattva had a vision of the hell realms on either side of them. And then last week, they had a vision of the marks of a lion king on their shoulders and all of the beasts and animals being in awe of them. And now the Bodhisattva is coming from the mouth and speaking the Dharma. Yes, I'm doing a little bit of insertion where it doesn't say the Bodhisattva will have a vision of themselves teaching the Dharma from their mouth. <laughs> it, you know, it, it doesn't go that far, but I do believe I have detected or we've detected a progression that is moving up if you're into chakras and why shouldn't we be into chakras? I mean, this is like, I've been talking about chakras now for half an hour, right? This is like a wheel, you know, chakra, by the way, of course, is that idea of a wheel. So we're talking about wheels all night, this Dharma chakra, all of that. And so the idea is, is that it does seem that there has been this transcendent process going on where we have transcended the hell realms. And indeed that was the vision of the Bodhisattva that they would see the hell realms on either side and see themselves passing through them unharmed. So there's this transcendence of the hell realms. And then something I didn't mention last week and I'm gonna digress just for a minute to last week's vision so last week's vision was that the Bodhisattva would have a vision of themselves, right? Um, having all of the Lakshana, all of the marks of a lion king, frightening all of the animals, all of the animals or beasts. Something I didn't say last week, and, and I actually really now look back and I'm like, wow, I blew it. There was this really, really, really obvious interpretation of that vision that I don't want to say I missed it. I just forgot to really explicitly say it. This the last week's vision could be literally of the Bodhisattva as a lion, like as an animal and have a vision of themselves cruising through the jungle as a lion and seeing and feeling what it is like to have all of the other animals scatter as you go through the jungle. And the reason why I say that, that that is quite possibly, a it, it's definitely a way of interpreting it, but it might even be the, the main way to interpret it is because there are many, um, uh, they're called Jataka tales. So these Jataka tales are, I don't talk a lot about Jatikas because they're not sutras. It's more of like Buddhist folklore, but Jataka tales are all of these stories of the life of the Buddha before he was the Buddha. And sometimes, often in fact, he's reborn as a lion. Actually, he is often reborn as a lioness, as a female lion. And so there are stories life stories of the Buddha before he was the Buddha being reborn as a lion and what it meant to be a lion king. And the idea is, is that from that state of being an actual lion or lioness queen, the Buddha transcended then to the human realm, but from that. And so there is a one way of interpreting this, that the Bodhisattva will have a dream or a vision of themselves when you were a lion, because <laughs> you were a lion. You didn't make it this far in your study of the Dharma if you were not a lion in your previous life, I promise you. <laughs> so my point is, is that last week, the vision may have been of actually one being reborn or one's life in the animal realm and actually in a way 
reaching the peak of the animal realm. And now tonight, today, this vision, the Bodhisattva has reached indeed the peak of the human realm because the, 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 the idea of all of these hundreds of billions of nayutas, a nayuta is a crazy amount of, it's like an unbelievable amount. So millions of billions of nayutas of kings coming and surrounding this bodhisattva to hear the true dharma, I would say that that's apex human, right? That's the idea is that if everybody else has come to hear the true dharma, then that's like the equivalent of being the, the lion king, but of the human realm, right? Questions or answers, anything going on? Everybody good? I, I want to say one thing, because I, I, I recognize, of course, that the, I recognize that the language of king is male. I recognize that even this vision could start to seem um, a little biased in that way. But there's an interesting historical figure, and she's a complicated historical figure, but there was an, an empress of China, the only empress of China. During the Tang Dynasty, the empress Wu Zetian. And the empress Wu Zetian is a, some, someday, I don't know how it'll happen, lecture series, or I'll try to write something, but this person is very interesting. They're, th like many, interesting historical figures, she's not uncomplicated. She's very, very complicated. It's not as easy as good and bad in that way. But the Empress Wu Zetian is very interesting because she claimed to be this wheel turning sage king as a woman. She rose all the way, she declared her own dynasty. <laughs> she broke off from the Tang dynasty and said, yeah, it begins anew with me. And the larger, longer, interesting history of the Empress Wu Zetian, this, this woman has so many interesting things about her life that could be spoken about. Tonight, the only thing I want to mention is, is that she claimed to be Maitreya. She claimed to be the future Buddha, female this time which is dope, which is awesome. I mean, that part of this story is really awesome because it's sort of like, oh, finally somebody that got the message that heard, and she was adamant about the fact of like, yeah, and I don't have to be reborn as a man. I'm Maitreya now. And so it's a really kind of interesting, empowering, fascinating story. Again, she's not uncomplicated. So if you find out more about her, you're might be disappointed, but in terms of murder, but the idea is, is, but the idea is, is that this, this position, even historically doesn't need to be male in that way. And so I would prefer, um, and if I mess up, forgive me, but I would prefer to kind of move forward with the language of monarch, like just in that, because we're not going to avoid the monarchical metaphor. In fact, I have a lot to say about the royal monarchical metaphor here, the, the king, the sage king and all of that. But I wanna make clear that historically this doesn't have to be male at, at, at all. And yeah, I just wanna leave it at that, that, that we, we can just kind of talk about monarchs in that way and have plenty of kind of historical references for such things. In fact, we don't even need to look back in history because the last time I checked the Queen of England, the monarch of the British empire, which is a pretty big empire, happens to be female. So she, so monarchanism or whatever you wanna call it is not limited to men in that way or women in that. So I hope everybody can get into the well, and in fact, I'm, I'm leading us towards 
a discussion of the monarchical metaphor that is here. It was, it was introduced last time with the Lion King. And now we're keeping going with this idea of the wheel turning king. And not only that, this wheel turning king is going to be surrounded by a bunch of other kings. And let's just finish this off so I can then really do the, the monarchical thing. So the standard English translation, meaning the book, they actually chose to leave something out. Um, and I kind of understand why they did. It's either, well, I don't know, but the Chinese reads that this bodhisattva will see themselves. And again, I want to make it clear that we do have that there, it's a self reflexive vision of themselves. Um, bearing all of these lakshana of the wheel turning sage king and teaching the true dharma that's all great they're going to be surrounded by uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of nayutas of kings under canopies under parasols that's what i've tried to draw here i need to mention something about the parasol so the parasol is an emblem of royalty. In particular, it actually is the emblem of the Chakravartin Raja, the, the wheel turning king. And there's sort of an interesting, um, I wanted to point out by the way too, cause I use these a lot, this is a little pack of these cards and these are Tibetan Buddhist symbols and it's this deck of cards and I really like them. You know, they're, they're a little new agey, but that's okay. I kind of like new age stuff, frankly, I'm into it. Crystals and stuff. It's like, why not? And so these cards, this happens to be the parasol, like the standard one. The parasol is one of the eight auspicious symbols that are used in Tibetan Buddhism. The only downside to the this is that it, it leans, it leans Tibetan. It's the only downside. So all of the, so each of these has a cool description on the back. So all of the symbolism of Buddhism, it's great. It's a great reference in a way. It's also just kind of fun to look at. Um, but again, it, it leans a little Tibetan. So everything is defined through the Tibetan Buddhist lens. But, you know, you go back here and there's some interesting information here. And even reading this, I was, it jogged my memory where I was like, oh, wow, that's interesting. So interestingly, the, the, or, the origin, the Buddhist origin, of the parasol, the canopy. The origin of this is actually the interesting story, it, the interesting story of the king of the Nagas. So the Nagas are these shape-shifting serpent beings in Indian folklore. They're a big part of Buddhism. They're like cobra people. They can kind of shift between being a cobra or being a human. They hang out in the waters. And the king of the Nagas, a being named Muchalinda, is actually a seven-headed cobra being. And I'm going to go grab it. I've shown it to you before. But there's this symbol, which is an image of the Buddha seated under, or seated on top of actually, a seven-headed cobra. So he, the Buddha is seated on the cobra's base, but this is Muchilinda, by the way, the cobra, and the cobra, Muchilinda, is actually covering the Buddha. And this actually supposedly happened at some point during the 21 days during which the Buddha was first enlightened, and he sat for three weeks 
underneath the Bodhi tree in this kind of rapturous samadhi. And during that time, the earth shaked and it was hailing and it was raining and all kinds of stuff. And Muchalinda, the king, the king of the Nagas, provided this canopy for the Buddha. And that is sort of the, it's, the beginning of this metaphor in Buddhism of the canopy. Eventually what happens is, is that the Buddha as Dharma Chakra Pavartan, as the Dharma Chakra wheel turner, the Buddha and the Dharma is described as a parasol providing refuge. You may have heard of the idea of taking refuge well, the idea is the Dharma is like a parasol that provides refuge from the heat of the world. Because remember, this is not necessarily an um, umbrella. It's kind of traditionally a parasol, meaning it, it, to block the sun, to block the heat of the sun. And so you can imagine that metaphor of the suffering, the dukkha, and the Dharma being like a parasol for the suffering, the heat of dukkha. But it keeps going. I want to also then remind you that if this parasol is a symbol of royalty, which it traditionally has been, it was like the king on his chariot would have a parasol that would protect him literally from the sun. And that was kind of a sign of royalty in a way. Muchelinda provides this sort of metaphorical canopy that becomes interesting, that spins into the idea of the Dharma as a canopy. But then I wanna remind you of the interesting moment in the Vimalakirti Sutra, the beginning of the Vimalakirti Sutra that I often mention, where these 500 Lichavi royalty come with their parasols and they all present them to the Buddha and the Buddha miraculously turns all 500 of those parasols into one giant parasol over the whole world. It's like such a beautiful metaphor, right? That just keeps going and going. And so I definitely think there's a lot of that going on here in that way. Um, but let me finish a thought I, I actually started a while ago. The idea is, is that in the same way that the hell realms were at our sides and that the animals had all scattered to our sides, in this realm, again, we are at this sort of apex human experience where our bodhisattva has reached the point of teacher. That's sort of the idea here is that up until this point, the Bodhisattva has been a learner in a way. And it's at this point that they have a vision of themselves now as a teacher of the masses in a way. And not just the teacher of like the masses, but a teacher of everybody. And I, I want to remind you, this is a vision. This is a vision that the Bodhisattva has. So it's not saying that before the Bodhisattva abides in the ninth stage, they will teach the Dharma to a bunch of people. It's that they will have a vision of themselves doing that. And what's interesting about this, and I hadn't really thought about it till just this very moment. Last week, I mentioned how the lion in Buddhism tends to be a metaphor for the teacher in that way. But before, even before that, the lion is a metaphor for courage, fearlessness, bravery. And last week I mentioned, it's kind of no surprise that the lion is a metaphor for a teacher because this is scary. <laughs> like getting up in front of people is, it takes bravery. It, it, you have to be fearless in a way to do it. Um, I, I reflect on it every day right before I tune in, <laughs> right? I re reflect on how kind of nervous I am in that way. But if I were to jump, like piggyback off that idea, I would say that when the Bodhisattva about to abide in the ninth stage 
if they have a vision of themselves teaching all of these people, that is a sign that they are ready in, in a way to do that. It's not, it's not a scary idea to do that anymore. It might even be an exciting idea to do that. So I wanted to kind of just point out that progression through these three. Everybody doing okay on questions and answers and ideas and yeah, no. Um, which tradition or when is the Naga story from the Naga King? Is that some Mahayana or? Um, I recall you telling us the story once, but. Oh, I yeah, I tell the story a lot. It comes from a few sources. There's, uh, I forget the exact source, but I do want to make everybody aware that there's a couple of, um, they're not sutras, but they're kind of like sutras. One's called the Lila Vasastra, I want to say. That's pulling, that's deep, reaching deep in there though. It might be called the Lila Vasastra, which is the great play or something like that. And the other one is called the, I can't even remember, but what they are, are these two kind of collection, they're kind of like Jataka tales in that way, but they're collections of stories. And they're both of these, I wish I could remember the name of the other one, but the Lila Vasastra is definitely one of them. And it's these kind of like real, either really late, uh, Theravada or very early Mahayana. And it's where you start to get a lot of the more folkloric stories that become Mahayana Buddhism, but it's still very uh, philosophically and, and otherwise still very early Abhidharma, 18 schools period type stuff. So yeah, Tanya. Well, isn't there like Nagarjuna? Like he went to the, didn't Nagarjuna go there? Indeed, and that's where these stories that I'm referring to and that's where it gets even more complicated that the Nagarjuna story is definitely Mahayana. And I mean, yeah, the um, I apologize for not having better sources for everybody in that way on this. And the re I get myself into trouble because I tell you these stories and these stories are often you know, I've, I've woven these together from a little bit of here, a little bit here, a little bit here. And then everybody's like, oh, where, where's that story from? And I'm always like, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's not that I made it up. I just stitched it together in a certain way, <laughs> in a certain way. So, <laughs> and if I remember that other one, I will uh, say it a little bit later. I have a question. It's a, just a weird point of curiosity that I've held for a long time. Every time the Lakshana come up regarding the actual physical characteristics, the marks of the Buddha, and I guess others, um, is, is this a bit of poetry? Or is this, is this something that was like retroactively applied to perhaps like alleged actual physical characteristics? Or does this have a tradition that goes back somewhere further into some other, um, yeah, religious tradition, these specific marks, the tuft of hair, the, just all these things. I've just always been very curious about that. If there's some other meaning or just poetry. Before Buddhism, there does seem to be this tradition of a, of uh, very wise people, maybe these early chakra vartans I was referring to with their chariots and whatnot. There was this pre-Buddhist tradition that enlightened people, wheel turning sage kings, whoever, have these 32 auspicious lakshana, auspicious signs. And in that early, that early tradition, Suzanne, I'm not exactly sure to what degree they were literal physical, to what degree they were more metaphorical and poetic, or to what degree they were actually somewhere in between there. They were actual physical things that were interpreted other ways. 
what I mean by, you know, you, you, you may be familiar with such things as, you know, the interpretation of freckles, for example. And the idea is, is that, it, you know, if somebody had a per certain, an, an, a certain array of freckles on their face or something, in particular, if they had a freckle anywhere near the middle of their forehead, somebody say, oh, that's the white tuft of hair. And somebody will say, but it's not a, it's not hairy or it's not white. And it's like, no, 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 it's, it's a symbol though. It's like, you have to see it the right way. All of that may have been, again, I don't know in the pre-Buddhist world what the 32 auspicious marks meant, but I will tell you, within the Buddhist world, when they say that the Buddha, the Tathagata, has these 32 marks, regardless of the origin of this idea, the Buddhists are definitely doing something that the Buddhists always do. They're always taking these really interesting, uh, like Hindu or just, you know, Indian ideas. They, all, they take these ideas and they do them a different way that's really interesting. And what I mean by that is, and let me, okay. What I mean by that is, is when we are talking about the lakshana, when we're talking about characteristics, you know, need, need I remind you about the color and this idea, right? Remember the color of something that, you know, you, you may think, you may be under the impression that I have a red round object in my hand and the redness and the roundness are lakshana of this. They are, those are two characteristics or qualities. Um, the size of it, the fact that it can fit in my hand, that's another lakshana. It goes on and on because lakshana are what we use to describe something and what we use to understand something. Now, if you've been coming to the Dharma doors, you already know what I'm about to do. You already know where this is going, which is that the, the wise, the, the Dharma eye, actually, the Dharma eye understands that the redness is not out here, but that that appearance of it being red is a phenomena that is dependently originated based on the unique structure of this eyeball and the unique structure of this. But the two coming together are what make the red round object that can fit in my hand. So what I'm getting at is, is that in Buddhism, they are very, very, very aware and very interested in the tricky nature of Lakshana that they already recognize that lakshana are not out here. They arise pratitya samutpata. They codependently arise. What that means is, so right now you're like, mm, that's interesting, right? Yeah, you know. But the idea is, is that what we are now talking about are the characteristics and qualities by which you might identify me, Michael. And you might think, yeah, Michael's the guy that has the white grayish beard all the time. He's definitely the guy with the man bun all the time. He's definitely the guy. He's definitely the, and you go through all of these lakshana by which you identify me. And you might think I have those lakshana. You might think they're over here right? What I'm getting at is, is that it is very, this is a long, weird answer to Suzanne's question, but what I'm getting at is, is that within Buddhism, they already recognize that lakshana are not lakshana, <laughs> that characteristics are not what you think they are. In, in other words, with, it's certainly within a kind of a Mahayana framework, within the realm of emptiness, all of these lakshana, they just fall right off 
they're not here in that way. They are a dependently originated phenomena in that way. And so what I'm getting at, Suzanne, is that it would definitely seem that these 32 lakshana are a more subtle, auspicious kind of characteristic that are left over <laughs> when all of these delusional lakshana have been realized, if that makes sense. Yes, I love that. Thank you. This has long been a, a something that I've just bandied about in my own little head. So thank you. Excellent question. And any other excellent questions? Okay, so I have something I have something to tell you. Um, I'm, I'm, we're going to get to the monarchical royal metaphor. It's what I've been alluding to. But we got it. We have to talk about something, and and something that you may have noticed. You might have noticed it last week. I did something tricky last week, and what I did last week, and it it was kind of intentional. But what I did was is that, you know, every week that we've been going through the visions, I have been, of course, you know, it's part of the visions that they correspond to each of the stages. But then I've also been pointing out that each of the stages correspond to one of the paramitas. And the idea is, is that the way that you kind of make it to the first stage is by practicing the first paramita, which is the paramita of generosity or giving. And the idea is, is that by practicing generosity or dana, by practicing this generosity, one eventually arrives at this first stage of great joy, pramudita. And it's this joy that you've never felt before because you thought joy came from acquiring stuff. We're convinced joy comes from doing this. And the Bodhisattva realizes that a much greater joy comes from doing this in, in many ways. And I'm not talking about money and stuff. I often say, kindness, attention. These are much greater ways of giving. And so the Bodhisattva realizes, oh, that's how I achieve great happiness and joy is actually this way. And so each vision that we've been going through, I have been mentioning the way in which it corresponds to its respective paramita. Except for last week. <laughs> I didn't mention last week, even though we discussed this idea of immovability, achala, and this idea of being imperturbable, impenetrable, in untriggerable, right? That was this idea of immovable. But I didn't really talk about the paramita that gets us to that state of immovability. And I did that for uh, actually a couple of reasons. First of all, let me tell you that last week's paramita, or sorry, last week's stage of immovability, it corresponds to the paramita that is called, in this text, it corresponds to the paramita that is called bala, power. Uh, bala is this, it's a Sanskrit word I've mentioned. Um, it's where we get the English word ballistic, and it's where you get the Spanish word balas for bullets. The Spanish word for bullets is balas. It's where we get the word uh, ballistics and things like that. And it all comes from the Sanskrit word for power. Now, power, what we are kind of talking about, we're talking about a lot of stuff actually with bala or power. We, we talked about it all one night, you know, so I don't want to delve too deep into it. But it is associated with the abhinyas or the ridhis or siddhis, these supernormal powers like clairvoyance or um, even uh, teleportation. All kinds of interesting ideas are wrapped up in the ridhis or siddhis or the powers. And it is a practice of the bodhisattva to, or a paramita even, to develop those powers. According to our text tonight, the paramita that corresponds to the ninth bodhisattva stage is the paramita of 
Well, in Sanskrit, it's called pranidhana. And it gets translated into English a bunch of different ways. This is probably the worst like translated word in that it just hasn't settled on a definition in English yet. It kind of has to do with devotion. It kind of has to do with if you imagine if you imagine if having a devotional relationship with a Buddha or a Bodhisattva and sort of maybe, maybe you have a statue or a tanka or something and you kind of have a, a kind of devotional relationship with that being, that's an aspect of pranidhana, but there's a more important there's a more important definition of pranidhana and it's actually could be translated as will. Like, like willing something to be. This idea of um, intention mixed with concentration. You know, as soon as you say will, W-I-L-L, -L, like will, uh, uh, like free will, you get immediately in English, wrapped up in, an, in a metaphysical ontological debate about determinism and free will and all of this stuff. And I actually don't think that that's uninteresting. I actually, actually think that the conversation about will and what is will is very, very fascinating. I don't actually want to have that conversation tonight about what is will what I want to talk about is that it is a paramita or a practice of the bodhisattva to will. And, and again, this is a kind of a uh, tricky thing to talk about. What does it mean to will something? You know, and it's like, geez, Louise, if any one of you, if I, any one of you, I, if I saw this and I was like, no, please don't, don't do it. And you were like, Michael, what does it mean to will something? <laughs> oh my gosh, how could I possibly explain it, right? But I think you might know what I mean though by willing something. Regardless, regardless, I digress. I mentioned a number of nights ago that the first six stages and the first six paramitas are very um, established, giving, moral discipline, patience, drive, <laughs> meditation, wisdom. They're, it's very weighed out, laid out, it's very clear. But if you read more in the Ratnakuta collection, or in particular, if you read more of the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Ornament Sutra, the, the Flower Garland Sutra. Something very, very interesting happens in the Avatamsaka Sutra. And what it is, is that you there are there's a chapter dedicated basically to each of the paramitas as they correspond to the ten to the ten stages. But you cross a threshold, and I mentioned this, it's actually why I took one whole night to just talk about the idea of upaya, the seventh paramita. And I mentioned that when you cross that threshold between the lower six paramitas and seven, eight, nine, and 10, you're in a new bracket of practice because there's a way in which, for example, number seven, upaya, you can't do upaya alone. It do actually doesn't even make any sense. Upaya without another doesn't make any sense. Dhyana, that makes perfect sense without, you're meditating in a cave, great. Wisdom, it's about no self, so great, fine. All of these other paramitas Moral discipline, this is about you and your body and how you deal with your body and all of this. But when you get to the idea of expedient means, skillful means, means to what? <laughs> what, 
Well, means to teaching, means to delivering the Dharma to somebody else. In other words, upaya is turning the Dharma wheel. That's the idea is that, that there's, it's, you know, again, you can't do it alone. It doesn't make any sense to be coming up with upaya to try to convince yourself of the Dharma. It, it, you already aren't convinced of the Dharma in that way. So upaya is this, this threshold where we are now deeply engaged in a practice with the other in that way. And so bala and pranidhana, and then the 10th paramita, knowledge, jnana, they all have to do with a kind of socially engaged type of practice in that way. In addition to that, in the Avatamsaka Sutra, when you get to these upper four paramitas, something very interesting happens. It's hard to describe, especially if you've never read the Avatamsaka Sutra. You know, again, this, this sutra is like a multi-volume epic, epic poem. So it's, you know, it's a very, very big endeavor to read it. But if you get to reading it, something very interesting happens. It's so beautiful. And what it is, is that they go through the paramitas, but as soon as it introduces the seventh paramita, it begins introducing the eighth, the ninth, and the 10th. And it basically goes non-linear. It's very hard to describe because what's interesting about it actually, and if there's anybody out there that studies literature, or the written word in that way, you might find this interesting. Books are linear in that way. They go from the beginning to the end. And unless we're talking about choose your own adventures, which are so fun, unless you're talking about choose your own adventures books, a book is linear. Every, you read, you know, you read down the page and, and it's like, there's a certain natural order to reading, which is linear. <laughs> It would be really weird if we, you, you learned to read by jumping back every fifth word to the first word and then jumping to the 10th word and then back to the second word. And then it would be hard to read if you read like that, right? In a very nonlinear way. So what's interesting about the Avatamsaka Sutras is, is as soon as it introduces the seventh, it begins weaving the other paramitas where it becomes confusing about which one has priority. And it's just a beautiful unfolding in the text where it describes these paramitas in a nonlinear way. I can't describe it. You have to read it. It's just something that happens. And what I mean by that, and I think the reason why it does it is because these last four paramitas, again, they are upaya, bala, pranidhana, and jnana, these skillful means, power, will, and knowledge. They actually kind of work as a, as a, you know, a fourfold practice in that way. And so they all kind of go together. And so it's actually very interesting that the Avatamsaka Sutra actually has Pranidhana before Bala, and this one has it the other way around, but that actually shouldn't come as a surprise because we're nonlinear. There is no priority in these. So I just wanted to mention that it's kind of why I skipped it last week because there's a way that bala or power pertains to last week, but there's also a way that pranidhana pertains to last week. These really work together. So power and will. Here's what's interesting. I just mentioned that the Avatamsaka Sutra, it's the other way around. And the Avatamsaka Sutra is sort of the, um, it's definitive usually. So the order of the Avatamsaka Sutra is the order of the Paramitas. So even though this one has these backwards, it is usually pranidhana bala with the general understanding in a way that one needs to pranidhana 
one needs to surrender to a higher power, one needs to devote oneself to that higher bodhisattva or Buddha. The general idea is, is that by surrendering that small sense of self to a higher sense of self, one acquires Bala. That's the normal way that this is described. This sutra sort of throws a monkey wrench in that by putting Bala first and then the, the Pranidhana. The whole reason, the whole reason I've gone through all of this is because if you flip it and do it the Avatamsaka way, it's not power and then will, it's actually will power. And indeed, pranidhana and bala are sometimes used as a contract, uh, contraction, as a one word, and there is actually no better, and I have only seen it translated into English once this way but there is no better English translation of pranidhana bala than willpower. And we have this idea in English of willpower, except we use it a little weird sometimes. What I mean by that is, is that in English, the, the contraction willpower tends to sort of, I guess, have the, the, the sense of like, withholding getting something that you want. It's like, well, I would really like to eat that whole cake, but I'm going to exercise willpower and not do that. That's not at all what I'm talking about. <laughs> at all, at all, at all, at all, at all. And it's definitely not what the Buddhists are talking about. They, and I'm, what I am now referencing, by the way, are sutras other sutras in the Ratnakuta selection in which they describe pranidhana and bala working together. And the way that they work together is by people willing something to be the case and that thing happening. <laughs> so li it's a literal power of will to manifest things into reality. Now we come to the monarchical metaphor in the Avatamsaka Sutra, in the Ratnakuta collection, all of this. So I've already talked about it a few times, but I want to really kind of state it really explicitly. The Avatamsaka Sutra and this type of Buddhism that we're dealing with here and have been dealing with for a while, it uses this metaphor of royalty, this metaphor of crowns, this metaphor of kings and queens. And I've said this before, again, I'm saying it, there's a way that you, you might have a um, a distaste for such monarchical language. I'm with you. <laughs> I am so with you. <laughs> but let's be good Buddhists in that way and put down, you know, those ideas or prejudices in that way and just hear me out on why Buddhism might be using this metaphor. So, the idea of the monarch, the idea of the king, in, in kind of more fancy philosophical talk, we would refer to the king as the sovereign. And one of the ideas or one of the things that's being spoken about in this monarchical royal type of Buddhism, we are talking about sovereignty. And I know that that's kind of a big word and I really hope in a way, I basically am just going to assume and hope that everybody has an understanding of that idea already. But I want to point out what it means to be sovereign versus not sovereign. The idea of sovereignty is that, well, the reason why a king or a king, sorry, a king or a queen is called the sovereign is because 
there is no one above them. <laughs> They're at the top. And the another way of looking at that is that everybody else is subject to the monarch. In fact, that is the literal language, of course, that is used within monarchies is the monarch and their subjects. And that is because you are subject to the rules of the monarch. You are subject to the, the, the monarch. Now, we don't live in England. We don't have a monarch, right? It doesn't matter because I still want you to be thinking about ideas of sovereignty versus not being sovereign. And what I mean by that is, is that as a citizen of whatever country you're in, I'm in the United States. And so there's a way in which I am subject to the laws of the United States. So I'm subject to the sovereignty of the state and the United States of America is sovereign. There is no country standing above the United States telling it what to do. But the idea is, is that I, as a citizen of that sovereign nation, am subject to the laws and rules of that. Now, I'm not trying to get into a conversation about anarchy and overthrow the state or anything like that. It's not, this is not what we're talking about. What I'm talking about, what we're talking about is the disposition or the feeling of being inferior to whatever it is. I don't care what it is. The Buddha doesn't care. Whatever it is, we are talking about the idea of being feeling inferior to and subject to something else. And what it is to be sovereign is to be on your throne in that way and to be your own, your own, to be sovereign. And actually, if I could say another word, it would mean to be free, to be independent. And so all of this language of sovereignty and the monarch in Buddhism, it's talking about being in a position of sovereignty, being in a position of independence and freedom. And there's something very, oh, this, this actually might turn into a good Dharma talk. It's good because it's going to do that thing where we're going to go full circle in that way. So the idea is, is that there's one way of thinking about the monarch and that idea of sovereignty and subject. And that is the kind of beat you into submission <laughs> by, the, by my might, by my army, by my hegemony. And if you don't know about hegemony, look that up, but right? So by my controlling you through culture, all kinds of different ways, I can subjugate you. The reason why I'm trying to make this Dharma talk go full circle to that idea of the Buddha as conqueror of Mara, as conqueror over greed, anger, and delusion, what Buddhism is offering us is a way to be independent and be sovereign without killing anybody. In fact, that's the rule is that the only way you get to really be sovereign, the way you get to be really free is by not killing. In other words, and this is, you know, this is the complex nature of reality in that way, but there's this way in which the sovereign stands totally independent in that sense. And what I want to get to, or what I'm trying to get to in the short amount of time that I have left, is that in in the old school way of thinking about the monarch, there could only be one. That, that's how it worked because, well, because that's how it worked. It's like the only, that's, there couldn't be two kings because then they would have to duel and fight it off to figure out who's really king, right? Now that's the other, that's that old archaic pre-Buddhist way of thinking about this. 
what's really lovely about this vision, what's really lovely about this, and I mentioned this last week about Vimalakirti and the thrones falling from the sky and everybody getting to have their own throne. What's beautiful about this is that we can all be independent and sovereign. They, they are not mutually exclusive because our sovereignty and independence is not dependent upon someone else's subjugation. I really, I, um, it's a good way of putting it. I kind of don't want to taint it with any <laughs> like, yeah, questions, comments, answers, ideas. Yeah, no. Yeah, it's it, I I to to me the um, the the freedom is from my own mind or the the machinations of my mind or the you know the crazy delusions of my mind, right? That's that's the freedom that and 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 we all have the ability to. It doesn't depend on you. It depends on me, right? And we can all do it. It's not like only one of us gets to do it. No, and it's a, it's a, uh, thanks. No, that's a beautiful reiteration of that idea of, of the Buddha as conqueror over greed, anger, and delusion in that way. That's a, anybody else? I do have one other thing that I think is actually an interesting segue to next week. It's a, a beautiful, another thing that just uh, came to me. So this is the ninth stage. We still have one stage of the Bodhisattva path to go. And, you know, just to let you know how this plays out in the world of Buddhism, after the 10th stage is Buddhahood, meaning that the 10 stages are inclusive of bodhisattva-ness. So the 10th stage is not Buddhahood. That is the last stage of bodhisattvahood. So we still have one more stage to go of bodhisattva-ness before reaching full enlightenment in that way. And I wanted to remind everybody of, um, you know, I'm, I'm, mentioning all these sutras, and I apologize if you don't know all these different sutras, but now I'm going to mention the Vajra Sutra, the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, often sometimes called the Diamond Sutra. And there's a chapter of the Vajra Sutra, it's towards the um, second half after about, somewhere after chapter 16, I think, I can't remember the exact chapter. Again, I'm just thinking of this right now. But there's a chapter in there that's about these signs, about these marks of a wheel turning king that our bodhisattva will have a vision of themselves having. And the Buddha asks, the Buddha asks Shibuti, the, the, the monk that's part of that sutra, can the Buddha, can the Tathagata be recognized or seen by the 32 marks of a, uh, or by the 32 marks. And Shibuti says, basically Shibuti says, yeah, that's what, well, that's the deal. And in that chapter, the Buddha says, if that's true, then a wheel turning sage king is the Buddha. To which Shibuti retracts his statement and says, oh yeah, then yeah, you definitely can't see the Buddha using the 32 characteristics. And that chapter is interesting because our Bodhisattva here is at the stage of a wheel turning sage king. They have all the marks of that. And that chapter of the, of the diamond or the Vajra Sutra is saying, if you're still even using that uh, me metric, the 32 marks and all of that, then you're still kind of in the realm of human beings in that sense. And so it's a beautiful little chapter 
this just this idea that kind of even though the bodhisattva will have the vision of themselves in such an exalted state as a wheel turning king it is still only the ninth stage in that way so um that's it folks that's what i have to say tonight about our ninth vision of the bodhisattva before abiding in the stage of subtle mind <laughs>